And now here is part two of the James Lopez interview. Do you have any idea why that picture ultimately wasn't made? Yeah. Um, what had happened was uh, they had a change of, uh, I guess, executives over at MGM. And, and that'll do you, it. Yeah, that'll do it. As you know, you know, the new guy wants to you know, take out all the old existing project, projects in place of their own. And so it just got shelved. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Um, so you're high and dry on Betty Boo, the project. Yeah. And what happens next? Well, I mean, we were, we were kind of out. And, uh, you know, I... <laughs> Uh, I spent a, about a month at the beach. <laughs> I didn't have anything lined up. Collecting out of books. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but while he was doing that, um, our uh, producer, uh, to his credit, he uh, sent, uh, drafted up a letter and sent it over to Disney Features. And he said, listen, you know, I, uh, I assembled this great, you know, group of people. Uh, but unfortunately, things, you know, didn't work out. Project As fell sometimes through. Sometimes they don't in As, movie land. Exactly. And uh, put a list together. So, would you consider any of these people, you know, to be hireable? And uh, uh, from my recollection, from what I heard firsthand, is that you know, the memo went around, and it came across uh, Chris Buck uh, desk, who, in which time he was uh, animating on Pocahontas uh, at that time, and uh, he noticed that my name was on the list, and he said, "Well, if you know." could hire him great I'd love to work with him and <laughs> but you never worked with Chris before at that point. um I had briefly uh at Hyperion because he was there uh producing he was there uh, developing a uh, um Tom Thumb feature with Steve Moore oh okay and Kevin Lima so you knew him from there at that time yeah uh-huh. so I knew him from then yeah uh-huh but you didn't work directly with him because you were on another project. Yeah. And I did, but, but they also, we also made like, he also made this short uh, with Chris Yore um, called Wooly Bully, which I think Paramount had the rights to the song, Wooly Bully, you remember mm -hmm. the old song. I said, well, let's make a short of it. And so we, they storied about it out. Really fun stuff. I mean, really, with, it was with monsters. You know, it was it, actually going back to it, the, the monster design looked very much like, uh, like Mike. From Monsters Incorporated does. He was oh, blue. Wow. He had big horns. Way before. Yeah, way before. You know, so when Monsters Incorporated came out, I was like, where does this look familiar uh, from? I'm floated like, through somewhere. Yeah, exactly. You know? Somebody who worked on something worked on something. Exactly. And they even had uh, a character in Wooly Bully with a single eyeball, you know, too. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, was this he a is... little yellow guy? Yeah, and, and, but they had like this little red guy, this little red guy that was a real spaz. It was a real fun thing to draw. You know, he would like dance around like Chuck Berry and I got to do those shots. And, and so I worked with Chris on that, you know, because I remember, you know, going back a little bit, I remember uh, one of the, my favorite projects was uh, Family Dog, the, the episode of Amazing Stories that came out shortly before I started at Cal Arts. Yeah. And I love that thing. So this was kind of like a way of kind of like, you know, working with Chris on that level, on a similar sure. project with that kind of sensibility to yeah. it. And uh, so so we got a chance to work with each other, you know. Uh, in addition to Chris, you know, he was my animation teacher, too, yeah. at CalArts. So, yeah. so we knew each other very well at that time, and he knew my abilities very well. So, huh. um, so he, you know, ultimately, you know, I give him credit for bringing me to feature animation, you know. Um, and so, I, you know, I got a call from the recruiter and uh, to get my portfolio, my reel together. And I remember I didn't really have a portfolio at that time because it, job, it came job after job and I never really had to put one together, you know. To get a like, job. So yeah, exactly. Why would you have one? Yeah, because people I worked with would leave and then they would get a job and they'd call me, you know, just because of reputation. And, um, uh and so I never had one put together. So I had to scramble and put stuff together. And they said, you know, you should have drawings from the zoo. And I, and, oh, I got to go to the zoo. And uh, and then they would call. And I said, when are you, when are you going to turn in your portfolio? I said, well, I haven't got a chance to go down to the zoo. I, I'm going to go down this week, you know, I promise. And and they was like, the don't recruiter finally it. said, look, don't. Don't worry about that. They just really want to see your reel. Can you just turn us in your reel? And so I turned in my reel, and then shortly after, I got <laughs> a, a call. How would you like to start working on Lion King? And I'm like, oh, great, you know. And and, and again, I remember 
at that time, Lion King was not really revered as being like the the movie that the movie of movies, a destination the movie. You know what I mean? Hit. You know, it was actually kind of a stepping stone to get onto Pocahontas. You know, that's what that's what everyone perceived. This was the secondary picture at that time. Yeah, exactly. Like Pocahontas was the picture that was expected to break all records and be the pinnacle of you know Disney's you know success. You know, being the you know epic romance story. You know. Um, and so when I, when I started on Lion King, they said, oh, oh you're going to work on this character. Uh, here you should see the reel. And, uh, and they told me which character it was going to be. And it, it just happened to be this character called Timon. He was this little meerkat. And, a side and, character. A side character. And I, I saw the reels and I thought, oh, my gosh, this guy's funny. He's going to be fun to work on. I had no clue later that it would become what it did, obviously. And, oh. and still, even to this day, that's like my claim to fame, you know? <laughs> it's like, Timon. I worked on Timon. <laughs> Timon and again, and Pumbaa. You know, yeah. Well, and that, and so did, did his footage increase as the picture uh, yeah. went through? Yeah, it did. And, and again, it was a situation where, I don't know if it was like, I think it was short-staffed or whatever, but they gave me some really key shots to do you know and um and i remember at that time too uh, animation clicked for me because uh you know i was working with mike surrey at the time and i would want you know go over to his desk to show him my shots and i i noticed on his desk you know kind of like a drawing of uh, timon and how it was drawn and noticing like the simple shapes that were being used but yet it felt and looked like the character and that's when it clicked to me partly like part of the animation process is learning how to uh, work create and work with a shorthand of your character and then later learn how to tie that down but initially use that gesture you know use those gesture drawing skills to you know, oh. really you know I, 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 I Chris demonstrated it to me forever, and, and, and I kind of got it, and a lot of people, you know, I watched a lot of people work, but for some reason it clicked with Mike. I don't know why, but now it, it finally all clicked. Everything now just kind of clicked by that time, hmm. and so I think that's when I feel like as though I really kind of took off <laughs> is from that assignment on, you know. I, I really felt like I had a lot collected that now mm -hmm. I just needed to apply it, you know. So what's your what's your approach to your when you have an animation assignment? I ask this of a lot of animators. Mm -hmm. Are you pose to pose to pose? Are you straight ahead? Are you a combination thereof? I do a lot. It's weird. It's like I do a lot of straight ahead, and then I kind of figure where my kind of key poses might be, and I tie those down first, and then I kind of work in between. It's kind oh, of like, okay. so it's like a, combination. a combination. Yeah, I'll just like, I'll sit down and, you know, it's funny. I, I would compare, like, the reason why I'm so big into, like, gesture drawing, you know, is because I look at uh, being an animator or the process of being an animator very much like being a reporter at a, uh, you know, uh, a news conference, you know, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. in which, you know, you have the speaker at the podium who's giving out all this information, speaking all this good stuff, and the reporter has to be there, and they have to take down, like, all these notes, but what they do is, you know, you look at their thing, they write a shorthand version of it, then they go back to their desk and they type up from their shorthand the final, the final thing. Well, that's how I kind of look at the animation process, or at least mine, is that there's this ethereal creative spirit that's speaking to me. <laughs> you know, my creative, my, yeah. my creative side is speaking to me, but it's speaking so fast, I can't possibly keep up. So I have to learn how to create a shorthand of my character, get that down quick. Right. Okay, and then once I got it down, then kind of take a it's already on my desk, then take it, and much like the reporter would do from all these scribbles and scratches, write the final words, I now take those scribble and scratches and create the final drawing and pose. But it's all about getting it 
trying to keep up with the 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 pace of you know my creative ideas you know that's that's the thing do all little thumbnails yeah like uh, thumbnails you know uh lots of times too recently more recently i i've started uh you know doing live action reference for myself um in which case what i would do is um you know and i wouldn't rotoscope but what i would do is i would i would do uh gesture drawings you know thumbnail drawings off of my live action performance so that way it was like once removed you know so you're sort of taking you're taking notes off of a live action yeah i would i would know i would make notations for myself as to where the uh, contrasting posture might be where the foreshortening is happening how shallow the arcs are being made you know i would just kind of make notes on that and then i would uh make those notes on a, a separate sheet of paper you know with a gesture drawing and then I would animate off of my gestures, you know, so. Oh, I see. Yeah, exactly. You're taking a bunch of pegged paper and you're, and you're uh, doing your uh, note-taking in key, key moments from the live action and yeah. then interpreting that into mm -hmm. your animation. Yeah, exactly. And then, and then that way it doesn't seem so rotoed, you know what I mean? I'm, yeah. getting, oh, yeah. I'm getting the essence of the pose and, and caricaturing it, hopefully, you know. Uh, you're not process. doing the Gulliver Travels no. tracing <laughs> no. of Gulliver over there. No, yeah, exactly. I, I use it more as inspiration, you know, because I'll, I'll look at live action, and it's funny. It's kind of elusive because you think, like, you think we we, uh, we do more than we do, you know. We, we move more than we do. I'm almost shocked, you know, when I see a, a live action performance, like, how much we're relatively contained. Right, <laughs> You right. know what I mean? Right. And again, you know, going back a little bit to that, that daisy scene that I animated a long time ago, it's like, if you have like a really good pose, a really proper one that, that, that speaks what it needs to do, communicates what it needs you to do, you can, you can stay within that. Yeah. You, know, you, yeah, you yeah. don't have to do a lot of this you know, stuff that people do now. I think it's just a matter of having the confidence to stay true. Do you, I have a question for you, and uh -huh. this is an interpretive question. Uh -huh. Mocap, which some DreamWorks people explained upstairs as rotoscope from mm -hmm. hell, <laughs> work, seems to work pretty well uh -huh. set in live action. Mm -hmm. I mean, Avatar, yeah, uh -huh. uh, pl pl the rise of the Planet of the Apes, where they've got basically mocap characters working against live action characters, mm -hmm. which seem to work. But when you put all mocap characters inside of you know something like well like the Zemeckis string mm -hmm. of mocap where, where it doesn't seem that already that audiences spark to that and react to that in the same positive way to me anyway that they react to real real animation yeah. what, whether it's hand-drawn animation or whether it's mm -hmm. CG animation yeah, that's this, I know what you're getting so, at what do you think the difference is? I mean, there's the uncanny valley aspect, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but why do you think one thing, if you look at box office figures, is embraced, mm -hmm. and the other is kind of not embraced by an audience? What do you think the difference is? I, I have a theory on that, and it kind of goes back to, like, I mean, even traditional animation animating... Uh, human characters and uh, uh, anthropomorphic characters. Uh, uh, it's this idea of the more you try to make it look real, the harder it is to pull off convincingly. Yeah. Um, so if it's caricatured more... If it's caricatured, it's easier. See, because if, it, if you're trying to go after realistic performance, we as human beings inherently have this knowledge of of how we move and behave and, and act and so when we see that it's not quite right it, it sets yeah, yeah. off a red flag you know what I mean and that's usually like with human characters in particular particularly human characters particularly human characters because you buy a big blue, blue tall guy from Avatar because it's an alien right yeah exactly because it's kind of a little bit removed like, like alien yeah uh, just like it, you know it's a lot easier to animate a walking talking dog than it is a convincing human uh, because uh, when you do a walking, talking dog, we have no point of reference 
you know, as to what that should be. Right. We've never seen a walking, talking dog before. We've so, seen walking dogs so, that don't talk. Exactly. So there, there's a lot of uh, license to be had there. But with a human character, it's either right or it's wrong. Um, this is why I think the way that they went about doing The Incredibles yeah. was the ideal way to go. They, they caricatured the designs. So they didn't try to assimilate a, an exact human. So there was some license there to, you know, be, I guess, imperfect, if you will, you know, uh, and give you that license. So the expectation wasn't that it had to behave exactly like a human. Right. They had some freedom there. And so, they didn't roto it. Right, exactly. So. You know, so that that's my theory. It's like the more you try to, the more you try to replicate real life, the harder you're just setting yourself up. Harder it is to sell. <laughs> the harder it is to sell. I think the more caricatured you try to get, it's a little bit easier yeah I, and, uh, yeah that's kind of what I've always felt because mm -hmm. I just it's the same thing mm -hmm. as slavishly rotoscoped mm -hmm. in a hand-drawn environment is yeah. always a little off-putting yeah and it's the yeah. same thing and you can spot it a mile away well the thing is <clears throat> like like we can everybody can but we can in the business more because what I realized you know my friend asked me says like she asked me a question like okay in Monster House what is it with the characters look funky and stuff like that. What is their hair? It looks like it's plastic or something. You know? Right, right, right. And I said, well, the thing is, being in the industry, we, we have that vocabulary. People who are not in the industry, they know something's wrong. They just don't have the vocabulary to be they able to express it. They don't know what it is. Exactly. They, don't know they how, can't describe it precisely. Exactly. They don't know how to say, oh, well, because it has no overlap. <laughs> What is overlap? Oh, never mind. You know what I mean? It's a well, business term, you know? Exactly. We know how to describe it, but, you know, anytime we think that we're, you know, tricking the audience, no, they, they get it. They sense it. They just don't On a subconscious it. level, it's yeah. just, that's what I've always thought about why mocap has been a very difficult sell. For right. instance, uh, the Spielberg picture, Tintin, mm -hmm. you know, it did pretty well in Europe, but it came over here and just laid an yeah. egg. Uh -huh. And I think it's because... When you go to look at it, they caricatured the characters. Yeah. But because there's, right. it's all rotoed. Yeah. See, they know. They they sense it. They just don't know how to express it. Like we could say, oh, it's because it's all on ones. That's why it moves too fluid. Oh, well, they don't do enough. Uh, uh, um, you know, they don't key have enough framing or yeah, whatever. key framing or something like that. They don't have asymmetry in their pose. Or, or you know that kind of a thing they, they don't know that you know but they do they they sense it you know for sure yeah and i it's just it's it, it it always seemed to me that even in um the roto that was done in snow white and the seven dwarfs not so uh -huh. much they caricatured snow white somewhat right yeah. but the prince always and i once asked an old timer uh in the 70s why why does the prince look and she says well we were running out of money, mm. and uh, we just uh, we traced the live action reference yeah. just because you know it was like we had to get the thing done. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he's not in the picture a lot, mm -hmm. but he's probably the least successful of anything in that movie right, because yeah. it's just rotoscope. Right. It's kind of like like some of the rotoscope stuff that was done by Don at the end of of his mm -hmm. feature thing. You know, it's just mm -hmm. there's something about it where you just go, yeah, mm. I know, yeah. And, okay, so let's move on. So after you were done with uh, Lion King, did you move on to Pocahontas? Or did yeah, you? I moved on to Pocahontas, <coughs> and I worked with Chris on his unit. And uh, I did uh, mostly uh, the Wiggins character, but then I also had a chance to work with uh, Duncan Marjorie Banks on his character, the villain. So oh, yeah, I think yeah. in the end, I probably did equal. I did Percy the dog and... Ratcliffe, and I think I did about equal parts yeah. uh, of each, you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, but at the end, you know, when it came time to uh, issuing credit, um, you know, they only allowed um, me to take one credit, and I think the one that I felt as though I was either most proud of or had the most influence in was the Wiggins character, so I chose that. Yeah, yeah. You know, as my chosen credit, you know. But, uh, you know, working with Duncan was... was was really neat too, you know, it was a real challenge because, I mean, his draftsmanship was incredible and the, the way, he, uh, some, yeah, it was just incredible and, you know, yeah, it was a, it was a hard act to follow. 
sure. And that picture did very well too, except yeah. it, didn't do, it didn't do as well yeah. as, as Lion King, exactly. but what would? I know, exactly. It's almost, like, it's almost like we got spoiled by Lion King. I mean, as good as it was for the industry, it was almost like the worst thing could happen to us because it was like, it showed like this is what it could ultimately do. So if anything didn't achieve that same oh, level of status, Lion it King. was deemed a failure just because. And I'm like, well, no, not necessarily. These people loved it. And, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So then you went on, you, you worked on Runaway Brain, did yeah, a little on, bit. Did a little bit of Runaway Brain. Uh, but then the one after that was, was Hercules. Now at that time, again, you know, Disney had so many productions going on. Yeah, um, yeah. They needed supervising animators, so they put out an open call, you know, and, um, and uh, looking for supervising animators. And at that time, you know, I had friends of mine who were really nice and they uh said you should try out for this absolutely like, and i i was like no <laughs> i'm not ready for this i'm not i'm so far from ready for this and, yeah, and they yeah. said but but so-and-so is doing it and they were also kind of an assist kind of like a new animator too and like oh really mm, and well, i was they're like doing it then maybe yeah, i, I should think do well it. maybe maybe i should just just try it i mean I, i'd rather i i live kind of life a little bit like you know it's better to you know try, you know, and fail than to not to ever know. You Absolutely. Know? Uh, so I put in my reel, and uh, Ron and John. This was for Ron and John's picture, Hercules, and they called back and they said they really liked what I had on my reel. They said, um, however, um, I think they already had their supervisors picked, but they definitely wanted me on their movie. Right. You know what I mean? So I'm like, hey, I'll take that. <laughs> All right, I'll be, you know? I'll be a, I'll be an animator on yeah, your movie. Exactly. Why not? And what had happened then is what I realized is that I was part of the, you know, like in basketball, how they have like you know like a first string, second string, you know. Right. I, I was that se I was part of that second string. Me and Brian Ferguson, and uh, they, I think they knew that because everybody didn't hadn't signed their contract yet that there might be some changes you know stuff like sure. that so they wanted to kind of keep people there in place just in case certain people somebody fell through, fell through. and sure enough uh, yeah it, it did fall through and I can't I can't remember who it was that that left that left and um, but that gave you a slot but it gave me a slot because I remember I think Nick Ranieri was originally going to do the characters that Brian and I ended up with and I think uh, Chris Buck was originally going to do Phil. Yeah. And Eric. Who did? Was wasn't it Eric that did Phil? Who he did? he ended up doing Phil yeah. because Chris left to go direct. I think he started Tarzan. He he, he didn't end up working on the picture because I think he got a directing thing. So that maybe it was Chris. I think that's who. Oh, it was. Chris fell out to. I go think Chris take fell out. So now they did a big change. Yeah. So now. So now I think Eric took over Phil, Nick took over Hades, and that left a spot open with Pain and Panic, in which you know Brian and I were sitting there on the bench, and so it's like, how would you? How you would did you, Pain. You did a Pain. You do Panic. Like excellent, you know. Like yeah, it was great. So. So how was that experience? How did you like great. being a supervising animator? It, it was great. I mean, it was really it was really challenging, you know. And I was up for it, you know. We, we, you know, at that time at Disney, we were really pushing ourselves artistically uh, we would go from I mean we were going from uh, an artistic style on Pocahontas of being mostly made of chiseled angled you know designs to going to Hercules which is very long swooping curves it's like, Ronald Cyril like right. the Ronald Cyril more Gerald Scarf more oh, Ger in particular right. you know uh, and it was like you know what is it when you take like a hot glass of water you put under cold water and it shatters it was like you would go from those extremes you know yeah, yeah. from angles to to curves and then you go to the next picture would be all about angles again so it took was a while that hard to switch back and forth yeah it was it, it took some time to kind of work those design sensibilities out uh but was really hard about the hercules thing is that you know working all curves you know one of the drawing principles being, uh, you know, straight against curve. You know, what do you do when you have to work all curves? That was really tricky. And, yeah. And, yeah. and, uh, 
and I worked really closely with Gerald Scarf in trying to do a lot of back and forth. Like I would do a round of designs, we'd fax it over to England and he'd uh, fax some stuff back and it was very, very loose. I'm like, well, this won't necessarily do, but I think I could take a little bit here, a little bit there. And we finally narrowed it down and we it finally, I think there was probably like one drawing that he finally faxed over that was a little bit closer to the sensibilities of what we were doing. It's like, okay, I can work with that now. Okay, I now know what to do with this. So after he got done with his gig at the studio, he was still working on the picture remotely from Britain. Now. Yeah, yeah, he would constantly like, you know, uh, observe what we were doing and you know, offer his opinion, you know, and stuff. But it was really good. And, and working with Brian in particular, I mean, we had two comedic characters that, you know, on different poles, you know, shape-wise and personality-wise. And, and uh, we really had to kind of get together and find a way to work with each other so as not to upstage each other. You know right. what I mean? Like, there would be times where, you know, his character would be the focus and I would have to kind of play down, you know, my performance to allow his character to kind of take the stage, you know, but still retain, you know, interest, you know, in my character, I right. guess. But, you know, it was real... It was a real team effort there. Now, supervising crew, which was probably new for you at that point uh -huh. because you're now a supervising animator, how, was that a comfortable fit or was it? Yeah, well, a little bit because I was kind of new at it. You know, I had been up to this point used to getting help. Now, I was the one that was supposed to have to give the help. Right. So, again, it was a little bit like, you know, again, baptism by fire. I had to draw upon all of the techniques that were you know, posed to me, you know, like through Chris and Mike and Bruce and how they, how they, you know, directed me and, and their temper as well, you know, like. Did you, you know, use any of them as a model of how to be a supervisor? Oh, totally. You know, like, for example, like Chris in particular, um, you know, when I was working for Chris, uh, you know, he would take a look at what I've done and he would say, you know, at times, you know, uh, it's not exactly what I would do, but, you know, it, it it does the job, it fits, you know. Now then he would concentrate more on on the uh, technical aspects of it. Right. Like, you know, the arcs, you know, the spacing, you know, that kind of stuff. Or sometimes he would say, if it really wasn't working, he would say, you know, try this for me. You know what I mean? It was never a do, you know what I mean? It was never like a real strict thing. It was always very, you know symbiotic you know so it was like it was like sure you know it was a very you know really I really felt like we were working together to make this performance so when I would work with an animator I would encounter those things where I'd be like okay again it's not what I would have done uh, but it does work so now let's work together because maybe the character wouldn't be drawn on model maybe the proportions would be wrong maybe the timing could be adjusted so we kind of worked together that way you know because they were also very new at, at it too yeah, oh yeah <laughs> so. did you ever have occasion to say you know looking at this footage this is exactly the way i would have done it <laughs> did you ever say that or was it eh, always no nah, not quite the way i would do it but well, some, well a lot of times too like i would get a performance and i'd be like oh that's a whole lot better thanks <laughs> like i'd be like Okay, I won't say anything. I'll just won't say anything. Good job. It's better that's than great. what I was I, thinking. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's pretty funny. Yeah. What about? And actually, then you worked on uh, what's one of my favorite pic one of my favorite pictures from the late hand drawn period, which is the Emperor's New Groove. Oh yeah. So, did you worked with Mr. Dindle and? Yeah. Well, originally it was uh, Roger Allers singly, and um, and I remember. He had approached me about working on the uh, the character's name was called Prince Manco. It was the David Spade character. Right. And I remember because it was contract negotiation time and things in the mid '90s were going crazy because Jeffrey had just started his studio and he was trying to lure people away. And oh yeah, and I remember all that. Yeah, it was it was a crazy time, and uh, so. Um, so I think they wanted to offer me something that I would like, you know, to kind of keep me there. And, uh, and they offered me this character, this uh, uh, David Spade character. And uh, originally, I, I, I think I wanted to do a different character. And so I think I kind of settled for that. 
Uh, but it turned out that through the in the screenings, it's that was everybody's character. favorite character. Oh and, yeah, Mr. Sarcastic. <laughs> and I remember because I think Nick and I we were we were both up for the same character, and I and I settled for the David Spade character. And then after seeing the reels, I think I remember Nick expressing to me at some point like he had wished that he had gotten that character. I chose the wrong character. <laughs> I think I chose the wrong character. I'm like, eh, eh. <laughs> yeah, no. But, you know, I had a real hard time with it. Really? To start. Oh, yeah. I Because the concept probably changed quite well, a bit. It was drawing a human character. I realized I'd never really drawn, but more of on the realistic side. Wiggins was more of a cartoon right. character, very broad and stuff. This had to be a little bit more of a yeah, balance yeah. between, you know, subtle and broad you know and uh and i had a real hard time with my first couple of tests and and um you know and i think that is when i started using live action i think that's when i really learned to use it really because did you use it as a reference yeah i used it as a reference i uh uh i, I finally did a scene and you know i even made a, a sword out of cardboard as a prop you know because he had a sword in his hand and stuff like that and I had acted out this scene and I, I used the reference and I animated it and and it happened you know I finally felt like I can do this you know I can wow. do this finally and then that next Monday it was like okay we're pulling the plug <laughs> we're not we're, doing it this we're, way. we're not doing it anymore we're, we're going back into story and I was like you gotta be kidding me after all but I, I'm glad that I got some closure out of it, you know, that I had overcome that obstacle of animating a, a, a human character before it. Before it now, did you stay with it. that character all the way through? No, or? because then what happened was because of, that yeah. character, when they revisited the movie, because of its success in the former version, they decided to make that the uh, main character. And I think, you know, I, I attribute it to possibly politics, you know, and, and you know... Uh, of the time. Yeah, the, the uh, what do you call it, protocol or whatever it was. That, you know, it's like I wasn't of that stature to be able to obtain a main character thing. So there were people that had to, you know, be taken care of before me. So they, they gave it to Nick. So Nick ended up <laughs> so getting Nick ended it. Up Nick with it got what he and wanted. Then, and so he comes back to me. <laughs> you know, and I was like, all right, fair enough. So I ended up, what did I end up with? with the little kids, I think, you know, doing one of the little kids. Tippo. Yeah. But then Bruce Smith came on at that time. I, mean, I don't think he was originally on the picture. He came on for the revised version. Yeah. And so I ended up working with him on his unit. So, you know, we were, we were back together again. And, wow. And uh, and I think we, we really did great. And he, again, gave me really, really good choice scenes, you know, to work on that, which really allowed me to exhibit my acting ability and stuff like that and uh yeah and it was it was really good working with mark you know i mean he was really you know energetic and and you know uh, active and i stuff. find that to be one of the most enjoyable and underrated mm -hmm. disney hand-drawn mm -hmm. features i mean yeah i mean i could i could actually i love it because it I don't even have to watch it. I could listen to it almost like a radio play. <laughs> you know well, what Patrick I mean? Warburton is just yeah. hysterical. It's like the banter back and forth between characters is so well, you know, written and timed. It's, you know, it's... it's. Oh, it's great. I mean, from an animator's perspective, it's great because you have so much to work with. I mean, it's it was actually the opposite. It was like the 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 writing and vocal performances were so good, the pressure was high as an animator. Like, I have to keep that up you know what I mean I, I can't drop the ball on that you know, right I have right to, right and many times before the the material was questionable maybe the delivery was questionable so as an animator like you're okay, having how to can plus I, it how can I make up for this you know I gotta pull out like this and the question here is how do I keep up with this exactly yeah yeah well and that's that's the thing that's interesting to me that mm -hmm. you know how and, and there's probably a point on that picture where people were thinking oh this isn't working mm. and Mark really pulled it together. Yeah, exactly. And you know, it's sad that Roger, you know, left, and I could see why. But you know, I mean, I think I think we ended up with a good picture. I mean, oh, I you to, did. I hate to say, you know, the end justifies the means, but I think in that case it might have. Yeah. So. And then you were on Home on the Range. 
And then I did Home on the Range. <clears throat> the and, farm and, animals. And that one, I love to tell the story because when they cast me onto the picture, they basically said, I remember the associate producer, David Steinberg, uh, at that time, he said, uh, okay, we're going to cast you all of the animals, uh, except for the ones that talk. <laughs> So the background, <laughs> so, the background. So I got players. the background characters, and what had happened was, um, you know, I said, okay, uh, hey, you know, Whatever I could be out right. on the street, I guess. Um, they gave one of the characters a line, uh, you know, one of my characters a line, or the chicken, I think it was. And I, I don't, maybe, I don't know what it was, I, maybe I felt like I had something to prove something like that but I said okay if this is going to be the only line that this character speaks it's I'm going to I'm going to wind up <laughs> I'm going to do it and uh, I came up with this test you know and uh, at that time we were meeting regularly to kind of check in okay what have you animated this week oh you're animating cows let's see oh very good you know okay how about you you're animated cowboy okay what do you got uh, Jamie you're animated chicken let's see your chicken test <laughs> and I played test. it and uh, it got a really big laugh it, it, it got a really good response and I think again you know a little bit like the you know the David Spade character kind of a thing I think I said well let's put more of the chicken in <laughs> you know wow. and uh, so so you got more I, lines I kept more lines you know I, I really felt like I earned it like <laughs> And and with that next line, it was it was a lot of it was pretty stressful because it's like it's feeling like man, I really gotta work hard. Push the envelope yeah. here. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> hey, I, I'm up for it. I'll do it. Why not? <laughs> why not? You know, and 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 they gave him more lines, and I think that's why. You know, as I would churn out a test that you know exuded a certain amount of personality, you know, I they said, well, you know, I think. I'd like to think that in the end that, you know, that they might have thought that, well, you know, if, you know, if Jamie can keep this up, you know, let's, let's try it. Let's you try know, it let's, again. Let's try it again. So you, you got know, lines. I got lines. Yeah. And like, and it was really hard because now it was like two or three characters, you know, the chicken, the pig, the, the little uh, piglets, you know, now all of a sudden I was like handling three different, four different personalities. And the duck too, like I couldn't really like focus at any time because I would do the chicken one week, then I have to switch gears to, you know, like a crazed chicken one week, and then to a very you know nervous pig the next week, and then feisty piglets the, the next week. So it was always this, this this change. And I think, you know, very much like you know working at Disney, like drawing angled one picture, drawing curves the next picture, angled yeah, the next yeah. picture. That constant having to constantly shift gears was a really good discipline to adopt, you know, and, and which is why I attribute, you know, I'm thankful for that. And I attribute to a lot of what I'm able to do is because I think I've been conditioned, you know, all these years to just be this able to just, yeah, go here to there, here to there on a, on, you know, on a moment's notice. You know. But then you have to switch to CG, which is really switching mm. gears. Mm -hmm. And you're uh, an animator on Chicken Little, so that how was that really work? tough. I mean, well, I think that the, the toughest thing that I had experienced with CG is that you know you're 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 kind of you're, you're kind of bound to somebody else's design sensibilities. You know what I mean? What I liked about hand drawn is that you had the freedom that it it was boundless. You were only limited by your own knowledge and ability. You right. know what I mean? You know, how broad to take it, what kind of designs, what shapes to use, you know, that kind of thing. Whereas what I found is going into CG, it's like, well, you have a choice between open close. Decide. I'm like, well, you know, it would be like, well, it's not going back to, well, it's not what I would do, but it's what I have to do. So what I found more than anything is that it was the compromise that was hardest to deal with. You know, the compromise in that this isn't the best that I could do, but it's what I. Somebody described it to me as digital do. puppetry. Yeah, a basically. little bit. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I couldn't put in, you know, and the method was different too. Like when you draw, you get this instantaneous feeling of putting down the gesture and the flow. 
we're CG, you know, you're constantly like moving these things into place. You know? Right, right, right. And so I found myself like finding gesture drawing to be even more important right. than ever because I would work out all my pose and gesture and keep that as a frame of reference to always, you know, refer back to because you get so easily lost in the in the mechanics in the mechanics rotating the the, the things that be like okay what was I doing again oh yeah I think I was trying to create Let's an look at the drawing what am I doing in the drawing <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly yeah well there's a lot of CG artists that came up through the hand drawn side right exactly they, they still use hand drawn as a reference yeah and that's always really fun to see when it's done really well I remember at that time in Chicken Little you know some of my favorite shots were from the animators who had that background because they were putting in things like the you know like the the stretched in-betweens and, and all those sensibilities that we're used to doing they would you know they would actually take liberties and, and what they call like break the rig you know again you know I think that that's why <laughs> Tangled has a whole different feeling because you had Glenn drawing yeah. over the CG animation well you know what I realized what he was doing which is what I'm you know, focusing my classes on now is, in effect, what he was doing was uh, by drawing over the CG animator's poses and pushing the poses and the expressions, is he was, in essence, uh, demonstrating how to caricature. Right. Is what it was. Exactly. You know, um, so that's why now in my classes, you know, I teach, you know, the hand-drawn animation, which, you know, I mean, there's not, as you know, there's not much of a business out of there now, and some of the students ask, well, what's the relevance of this, you know, if there's no, you know, job potential out of it and stuff like that. I said, well, no, because what I'm going to teach you is, you know, what I've decided is that I'm going to teach you how to caricature, you know, and that ability to be able to caricature can transcend yes. into all different departments. It can transcend into a uh, you know, your CG animation, it, your poses for animation, it could transcend into your visual development, your character designs, even your uh, storyboard work. So, you know, but all of that comes from all of the experience that I have as a traditional animator, because right. that's where we get our start from. And I right. remember, you know, early on in, in the training, you know, they would, you know, we would learn about character. We'd show, we'd, we, we, they'd show us pictures like, Earl Oliver Hurst and, uh, you know, and Searle and, and uh, you know, a lot of classic illustrators, you know. Sure. And, and, and a lot of our training, you know, a lot of our upbringing, too, came from comic strips. I mean, I used to draw from comic strips, too, like, you know. Oh, yeah. Like Wizard of Id and Peanuts and, uh, you know, everything. You know what I mean? I used to copy a lot of those. You yeah. Know? Oh, yeah. So, you work your way through Chick a Little, and then you're... Did you stay at the studio, or did you depart? No, I, and... I left. Um, I left shortly into production. Uh, I probably won't get into it <laughs> as to why. I mean, was it, I mean, was it at the end of uh, was it at the end of Chicken Little that you left, or was it? It was kind of like early on in Chicken Little. It, 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 things weren't good. So you uh, moved on. I moved on. Yeah, exactly. So what did you do at that point? Um, well, what had happened was. Um, I had this opportunity to work on these uh, animated sequences in uh, the Fat Albert movie, the live oh, action yeah, Fat yeah, Albert yeah, movie. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and it was great because it was like, you know, we thought we'd never get to do traditional animation again, and yet here was an opportunity to do it, uh, even though it was kind of on a small scale. But still, you know, it's like, I'll take it, you know. And that production was really interesting because, you know, they were looking for somebody who could... Um, take the existing designs but tweak them enough because I forget who held the rights to the original but they couldn't use the old designs Royal or Filmation <laughs> yeah, Filmation and, and I think there's this other company that held the rights to them or something like that so we had to we had to kind of come up with a, a, a similar one that resembled the characters but would basically hold up in a court of law <laughs> when put side to side right. oh they're not those yeah and so, uh, uh, Bert Klein, uh, you know, a, a fellow co-worker, a Disney animator, he uh, uh, got the job to direct the animated sequences uh, in that, along with, uh, along with Chris Bailey, who uh, supervised, I think, as well. Um, and uh, so, Bert basically, you know, hired me to do the, 
character designs. And uh, he wanted to do them, you know, like Bruce Smith had done with his Proud family and uh, and uh, Baby's kids. And I, I always like to think, like, well, if they could have hired Bruce, they probably would. But I, I call myself, like, the Kmart Bruce Smith. It's You're like, the Kmart Bruce Smith. Because <laughs> you walk along with Bruce Smith and exactly. you can channel Bruce Smith. Exactly. It's like, when you can't get Bruce, you get me. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> You'll settle for me. So uh, so I did. I mean, I, I kind of approached it. I kind of said, well, hey, how would Bruce do it? You know, and, <laughs> and, and so I, I pulled out all those, you know, design sensibilities that he does, you know, that I've picked up with over the years. And, and they were really happy with it. And um, so we went with that. And uh, now the kicker was, is we had a studio up north in Canada that they were farming the most of the animation too. Right. And um, I love telling this story. It's a, uh, because it's a, classic, it's a classic example. I like to think of a classic example of taking it back, you know, kind of a thing. <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> we found ourselves spending so much time fixing the outsourced work. The Canadian animation. Yeah, that we were saying, you know what? In the time that it took me to fix this, I could have animated it right the first time. <laughs> and so we got together as a group and we marched into the, the executive's office who was overseeing the production of it. At the time we said, look, I'll strike you a deal. It says, let us hire a few more guys here. Let's take back the work from Canada and we'll do it all here. And they said, yeah, you realize you're going to have to do like 20, 25 feet a week. I says, yeah, but, you know, 25, 25 feet of our least effort would, is still better than the outsourced 15 best feet of ever. their Right, stuff. exactly. And we so did, where did you animate this? this uh, over, over at the uh, Glendale Galleria building when they were over there uh, here in the... Uh, uh, was it called? Oh, Sherman Oaks. Oak. Sherman Oaks. Yeah, you were at the you were at the Warner Brothers. We were at the Warner I remember Brothers. walking through, and there yeah. you all were. Yeah, yeah. When they had that big <clears throat> facility at the at the Galleria out there, and we did it. We we worked hard, and we animated twenty five feet a week. <laughs> so you designed it, it and animated. it. We designed it and animated it all all here, you know, and uh, and and we're really proud of it. You know, we're really proud that you know we we showed them that you know it's like you know we work hard, you know. We could do it. <laughs> and you did that pretty quick, too. And we did it pretty quick. Yeah, it was. It's, again, it was. It was a blip Didn't have a on the budget. Screen. It wasn't a big budget, and and we had a really, I mean, the ultimate compliment because the director uh, expressed to uh, you know Bert later that you know had he known that the animation quality would have turned out as it did. He, he would have pushed for more of it in the movie, you know. Because you only so, had like about eight minutes. Yeah, it wasn't really that that much, you know. So, but that was a really good compliment. When people want more of what you have to offer, Absolutely. that's that's I think is a really good compliment. Yeah. So, at that point, did you get the swan the swan signal to come back to Disney, or where did you move from there? No, I, I after that, um, you know, uh, uh, Bert's wife uh, got a gig uh, doing storyboards on the. Uh, Tinkerbell shows, you know, so I did that uh, for a little bit, you know, working for uh, uh, Tony Bancroft's uh, Tenacious Company here in Burbank because yeah, yeah. they were outsourcing it there, and and um, and uh, you know, again, it, it was one of those jobs where it's like it was going to be a straightforward storyboard thing, but by the end of it, we found out that uh, we were starting to build animatics, and I, th I think around that time. Uh, Animatics just started becoming popular with executives now. They wanted to see moving storyboards. Yeah, it's basically, you know. you, it's like baby weems. You yeah. animate it in the animatic. Yeah, exactly. And I, you know, a lot of that coming from the Iron Giant. You know, when when they did that for their executives, and so now it just it became now a standard. And we're like, okay, well, so now I found myself doing storyboards where I was doing a separate background and a separate character, and then on a separate sheet doing a mechanic sheet. For the After Effects guy to, <laughs> right? Oh yeah. How are we going to pan across this background? Doing it was like multiple. It was like doing scene planning, you know, scene planning. It was more like doing scene planning and layout than it was storyboarding. You know, really. Mark Kennedy said they couldn't do storyboards like Bill Pete did them. No. That's no, over. That's over. It, because yeah. you've got to have so much mm -hmm. more, mm -hmm. uh, more 
more action, more poses, more yeah. everything. So. Yeah. And then, uh, what did I do? Then I went to Renegade to storyboard on their shows. And again, same thing. It all went digital. It started off with the three panel 11 by 17 paper to, uh, you know, doing it in Flash, you know, doing these full on Animax or Flash. But it was great because I had a really fun time. I mean, I, I got to import music and I got to edit my uh, You're basically sound building effects. the animatic. You're, you're building the animatic. And again, Learning how to do that allowed me to do, you know, like the current project I'm working on. You know, it, 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 it you know, I was able to kind of build a, a semi film and, and and design it, you know, from 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 nothing to the final thing. And uh, so again, I'm thankful. You know, it's funny. You know, when I when I initially left Disney, uh, I, I I was a little, I was kind of devastated. It was kind of a it was a, a big chapter in my life to, to end. Right. And I was really scared, you know. Sure. But, Everybody would um, be. Where am I going now? I wouldn't take it back because the experiences that I've had leaving that place, you know, right. designing for Bert, you know, uh, you know, animating, you know, on the things, uh, doing the animatics uh, uh, for Tinkerbell and the, the other show. I mean, I've grown so much. You yeah, know? you wouldn't have had that if you stayed I, at I, the big studio. No, I wouldn't. I would. I would just be. I would just be an animator. You know, there. I, that's all I would do. But then leaving, it's like now, you got to be a production designer. You got to be a head of layout. You got to be a, you know. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know this kind of thing, and it, and it was great. And now I may. I was able to come back, to Disney, uh, after my short, you know, uh, stint working at DreamWorks on B Movie and uh, Flushed Away. Uh, to go back to work. For for Disney on Princess and the Frog. Um, but in that time, I had worked on a short film with uh, Bert and Jennifer Klein uh, called uh, The uh, Pups of Liberty. Oh, and, yeah, sure. Um, he told me about that when yeah, he was which, talking here. Yeah, yeah, which which was up for an Annie Award uh, a few years ago. And uh, But, you know, I, I'd worked on that thing, you know, and it started off like, you know, you know, would you help us do workbook on it? You know, okay, I'll help you do workbook on it and then that went into will you will you help us do you know uh, rough layout and then we help us do cleanup layout and then we, we paint backgrounds for us and it kept going and going but again I'm glad that I met those challenges because oh, sure. because oh, that's that's where the fun is yeah because up until that point I'd never touched Photoshop I mean I, I learned Photoshop on my own by working on that project you you know? enter the digital way I did yeah. so how long were you at DreamWorks? You did those two pictures. Yeah. And you were you were boarding or were you animating? I was uh, CG in it, doing animating and CG. You were CG animating. Yeah. And that's when they had announced that they were doing Princess and the Frog again. And already I was gone. You know, so I was you like, said, okay. I'm I'm back over here doing hand <laughs> Yeah, well, in the, yeah, I already had my mindset, although I was still there. And I, I think they sensed that and they said, well, you know, we'll let you go because we know you're not going to stay. <laughs> and you've so, been back at Disney ever since. Yeah, I've been back at Disney ever since. Uh, but when I came back to Disney, I, I surprised Ron and John because I said, I want to go into layout this time around. I'm like, what? Well, we want you to be a Zambier. Well, after working on Burt and Jennifer's film and doing all this stuff, I said, I, I think I can do layout. You know, And I knew that they wanted to do animatics for Lasseter. I said, well, I, I can do this, you know. And, so, what, and did so you do, what did you do initially on that film? Well, they brought me in initially. They, they wanted me to do the character poses for the animatics, you know, is what they wanted, you know. And, uh, and we did. We, we, we really worked really hard, and we did the villain's song first. And uh, we pulled out all the stops. We did new poses and had the characters move, and, and it went over really, really well. Um, and ideally, like, you know, my poses were going to keep going on through animation. And, and some of the animators expressed, wow, we finally have decent character layouts, you know. Even though they weren't using them verbatim, it, it really helped a right. lot more. They, because, they had a blueprint. Yeah, they had a better blueprint, um, something they could use more. Um, but then, as they found, as the production was going on, it's like, well, we have to turn around these things too fast. We don't have time for you to do all these drawings, Jamie. And I was like, okay. And so then that kind of got a little stagnant. And I said, 
But they had always said since I came back, they said, look, uh, if you ever want to go back into animation, you're welcome to do that. So I'm like, so that door was open. So right around that time, I, I said, okay, how about if I go back into animation? They were like, ah, thanks, we were hoping you'd do that. And Bruce in particular was really excited because, you know, while I was at DreamWorks, I had met with Bruce because he was on by that time. And I had looked at some of the uh, initial rough tests that he had done. And by that time, it had been a long time since we'd seen really good traditional animation. And I had forgotten, you know, yeah, yeah. what, you know, the power that it could have. Yeah, yeah. And when I saw Bruce's test, he, he did the thing of the villain dancing and he, and he ended on this look and he had like one eye peeking under the brim of the hat. I was just, I was like, oh, it's like we don't do that anymore. We don't put that panache into our poses anymore. Nobody knows how to do it's that. Tough to do. Yeah, except for Bruce. And I said, you know, I want to do that again. You know, I want, I want to work with you. Yeah, yeah. I want to be a Jedi like my father. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so you and Bruce were working together again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was really glad when, when I decided to go back into animation and. Uh, and we did, I think we did really, really good. I mean, it was great working with him, you know. And, you know, and again, Bruce, he, uh, unlike any, like supervisors before, he really pushes to do that unconventional uh, acting, you know, that, those choices that aren't, you know, like Bruce would say, you know, he doesn't want to do any kind of animation that you can reference from Sword in the Stone, you know right, what I mean? Yeah. You know, he, he wants to do something new, like he's always like, you know, unique expressions, unique mannerisms, whatever it is, you sure. know, and it's always a challenge, but I, I'm always up for it, you know, and uh, yeah, so I remember the hardest scene to do was this scene with uh, Facilia in which uh, he was demonstrating for his uh, cohort, cohort uh, Lawrence, you know, the power of the necklace, and he you know, he, he puts on the necklace thinking it's going to change him into a different person. And he goes, you know, and, and like, ah. and again, it's a hard thing to do because you couldn't go to Sword in the Stone. No, nobody has ever done that, right. you know, kind of thing before. And that's what Bruce wanted to put in. So, again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm acting it out. I'm studying. I'm like, okay, oh, look, the hand is foreshortened, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. And it, it's great. It was like recapturing a, a, a past process before that I oh yeah it's been lost you know it's like oh, that, yeah. you know working kind of working in CG it's all about what was the constraint on and blah 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 and I'm like oh that's like that's so far from what I'm used to worrying about yeah well it's a whole different <laughs> it's a different thing yeah exactly I mean you know, there's overlap I'd, but there's yeah. it's there's different things to worry about yeah and then you finished you finished on Winnie the Pooh and what did you do on that? And then you worked recently on Paper Man. Yeah, I, uh, you know, it was weird. We had like some downtime after Princess and the Frog, and uh, and uh, you know, I, I think they came up with odd jobs for us to do, and then Winnie the Pooh kind of came around, and uh, it was weird. It was a little bit awkward because I mean, for the longest time, you know, we, they kept telling us we were going to get shots, and I never got shots, and yeah. and. Um, and finally, when it neared the end, there was this Baxen sequence. So it was a special sequence, musical sequence, that was supposed to be appear as though it was drawn in chalk. And, and this, know, is for, this is for, for the Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it was to be like their Humpha Lumps and Woozles song, you know, <laughs> their version of it. And uh, uh, But it required a unique application because we had to animate in pen and we also had to draw very much like a child would draw. So I remember my first tests and showing them to Eric Goldberg, who was directing that sequence. He took a look at my drawings and said, there's one problem. Uh, these drawings are too good. <laughs> it wouldn't do these. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, they have to look like a child drew them, you know? So, so I had to go back over it again. And uh, I mean, it, I was struggling. I was like, how do you do a bad job? <laughs> you know, I mean, I was like, I was right-handed. I thought, well, maybe if I draw with my left hand, would that work? Oh, that's... Uh, you, you have to, you have to I, channel an eight-year-old. I really had a channel to go back to when I was five and, and looking at my drawings. And you had them all. So you could, and I oh, had okay. them all as, as a reference. I really had a channel back to, like, 
like I was drawing like I was so you came you full know. circle came totally full circle you know <laughs> so well that's that's really funny yeah well now here's my last this is our final question I asked this of everybody and somebody got on me for not asking it of somebody I get tired of asking it but what would be your five uh, biggest pieces uh, the five pieces of animation or animated features or animated shorts five if you can think of five that inspired you jazzed you helped you get propelled you into the industry or that mm. you worked on and said this is really one of my favorites mm. can you name five and you don't have to you can name two yeah I'd, I'd have to yeah think a little bit I mean a few there are a few s shots or scenes that kind of come to mind uh, that stick out. Uh, you know, um, the one that for comes to mind first is uh, Maleficent from Sleeping Beauty. I think when she's uh, speaking to uh, Prince Philip, you know, in the dungeon, and and there's this close up on her, you know, as she says, you know, uh, you know, the years roll by and. A hundred years to a steadfast heart is but a day. I uh, I remember that because it was all this inflection in the eyes, you know, and the way it was art directed. It was like there was something very sinister about it, you know, that, that really, uh, ooh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's evil, <laughs> you know, and that, that stuck out in my mind. So so stuff like that, uh, that, that has that kind of spirit behind it. Um, you know, I, I mean, two, I mean, a lot of the, 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 the video games that Don Bluth did, you know, because it, it, they came out at a very impressionable time in my life, you know, I think that Space had a Ace lot, yeah, the Space Ace and the Dragon. Dragon's Lair, I think there's, you know, there, there was, they, they were so bizarre, you know, they were, they were very well crafted, but yet in concept, they were bizarre. I mean, it was, yeah, yeah. it was very, yeah. uh, it's kind of a liberating thing to see in a way. Um, yeah, and I think like, uh, I, I, I liked a lot of the independent things. Like I liked, I liked the, uh, the video with Paula Abdul with the cat, you know? I, oh yeah. You know, I, I remember these things. I think what I really, the five things I get out of it is that, that free spirited, uh, free spirited animation, you know, the stuff that usually isn't done uh, by a studio that is done by people who are looking to prove something, you know what I mean? Because, sure. you know, they, they, these people, they, they, they got out there and they said, this is our chance to shine outside of a, of a studio environment in which we're expected to blend in, you know? Uh, I think those are the, the projects that I like. You know, those are the pieces of animation that I think affect me more because I can sense it. I can sense it when people are trying to, you know, burst out and, and, and exhibit their, their hmm. the full potential of their creativity. You know, whether it totally is something that can be referenced forever is almost, uh, uh, doesn't matter. It's, it's the, I love the spirit behind it. I love the effort, you know, that went behind it all. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what I really like. Yeah. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think we are about Great. done. Okay, so thank good. you, sir. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. Thank you.